you hear us and others talk all the time about gamma, right? Gamma, 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 right? Whether it's a gamma squeeze or it is gamma positioning from dealers. Why do we like the Greek alphabet so much, Craig? Well, when we talk about things like gamma and delta hedging, what we're really talking about is flows being driven from the options market. And, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time focusing on the options market because it is just growing exponentially over the past several years. And now we give the analogy of it's the tail wagging the dog. Um, so we track these because it gives us some insight into how, how option dealers or market makers are positioned and how much they're going to have to buy and sell, giving certain changes uh, within the underlying asset like the S&P 500. So let's use a really simple example here, right? When we're thinking about what dealers are trying to do, first, dealers are not standing on the other side of the bet from you with the goal of making money based on you being wrong, right? The dealers are actually focused all around transactions. They want to capture the bid and the ask spread. The problem with the options market, though, is that because there are so many issues and because each issue is somewhat unique, right? Do you buy the Apple you know, 260 calls or do you buy the Apple 240 calls? Do you buy them in October expiry? Do you buy them in December expiry? Or do you buy them for next Tuesday, right? These are all different strikes, tenors, et cetera, that are very different than simply saying, hey, I want to buy shares of Apple. And so when you buy in the options market, almost always you're going to be facing a dealer. There's not really going to be somebody on the other side of that trade from you who's trading with the opposite perception that you have that is different than the traditional stock market. At the same time, the dealers don't want to take that directional risk that's created by being on the opposite side of the trade from you. So they'll go out and hedge their position. Now, a really simple example of this is let's imagine you bought an at the money call in something like Apple. Assuming it's relatively short dated, that means that the delta is going to be about 50, right? If it goes, you buy a call option and Apple goes up, you benefit. How much does that call option go up or how much is the exposure? Well, that's actually what Delta is telling you. That is the hedge ratio for those Apple shares. And so if the option is currently at the money, typically that'll be a 50 Delta. There are some wrinkles around that. But that basically what that means is, is that the dealer now needs to go out and buy back its exposure. So I buy a share, uh, I buy uh, an, a single option contract for 100 options on Apple at 50 Delta, a dealer is gonna hedge that individual position by buying 50 shares of Apple, 50% times 100 shares. Um, if the price of that option goes up, that option is now in the money and becoming more and more like Apple stock itself. It moves from 50 Delta to 75 Delta. When that occurs, the option maker is now short Apple and in that price increase, they have to actually buy shares of Apple as well. So this is part of the reason why this is such a big deal, because what we're actually describing is forced behavior in which the option market makers are being forced into price behavior or transactions that feel silly, right? Like who wants to buy more when it's higher? Obviously momentum strategies, but likewise a dealer who is hedging Delta exposure. The reverse can be true on the downside. So when we think about this and the growth of that, that is because of the growth of the option space, this has become a really critical dynamic to explain. It behaves some of the components of intraday persistence, right? Once prices start rising, dealers have to chase. It also explains a lot of the pictures around overall volatility. Because if dealers are in what's called positive gamma, in other words, if the market has net sold them optionality, it typically means that when the market goes higher, they actually get longer. When the market goes lower, they naturally get shorter, right? So they're actually benefiting from it. But that also means that they need to adjust those delta hedge ratios in the opposite direction that the market goes. So market goes up, dealers sell. That pushes the market back down and lowers the realized levels of volatility. That's a critical feature that we see all the time. So when we talk about dealers being in positive gamma, and again, I apologize, gamma measures the change in delta, that hedge ratio, for 1% change in price of the underlying. So again, positive gamma, you get longer as the market goes higher. Negative gamma, 
So you get shorter as the market goes, uh, I'm sorry, negative gamma, you get shorter as the market goes higher, right? So that actually means you'd need to buy more shares of Apple as the market went higher, forcing the market to chase Apple higher, right? That's why positive gamma conditions create lower volatility, negative gamma positions create higher volatility, or at least the potential for them. And we really have not, I mean, David and I talk about this all the time, but we really have not seen high volatility episodes emerge unless dealers are in negative gamma positions, right? It creates a feedback loop that can cause the market to feed on itself. We've witnessed the opposite of that basically in all of 2023, right? The market by and large has been in a largely positive gamma environment. So lots of things that we would traditionally think of, certainly if we were in 2022, would have felt catastrophic, right? The failure of Silicon Valley Bank, um, you know, Japan needing to change its interest rate policy. These have all been things that you would have thought could have caused significant volatility events and just have failed to, right? Because the market is, again, being somewhat driven by this tail wagging the dog phenomenon. Okay, um, let's go to... Um, slide number seven. This is actually the signature chart for tier one. It's the picture that you see on many of our uh, uh, many of our logos and introductions. And it is this issue of what we call positive gamma or negative gamma, looking at the exposure of the dealers in the options market. Craig, could you walk us through how to read this chart? Yeah, sure. So what this chart is basically showing is how much um, hedging flows are going to be generated per one point change in uh, the S&P 500. So we've actually combined uh, SPX and SPY to give a bit bigger picture of the landscape here. But um, so you can see right now that the uh, flow per index point is at around 444 million dollars per one point change in the underline, which is SPX. So um, you could look at this also as in like a 1% move, in which case a 1% move would trigger about $20 billion in hedging flows. And again, um, you know, when we're in a positive gamma regime, that means that these dealers are going to be selling into that strength and buying into the weakness, which causes markets to um, mean revert. And it's a lot of the things that we uh, see intraday, like Mike was mentioning, when we have some bad news event come in, well, why didn't the market react to that? And if dealers are in positive gamma, it's because these dealer flows were able to stabilize some of that volatility. So that actually is a perfect opportunity to go to slide eight, which illustrates this dynamic of the volatility regimes based on dealer gamma exposure. So... Um, Craig, could you maybe talk through what these two slides are showing us? Yeah, so both of these slides are showing um, just in, in semi different ways, but both of them are showing that there's a clear difference in price action and volatility, depending on how dealers are positioned. Um, so the first chart where you see these two curves on it, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the when dealers are in positive gamma, you can see that the distribution of returns is much tighter versus when dealers are in negative gamma and you see, tend to see these fatter tails as volatility is increasing. Um, and then the, the second chart on here shows the five-day realized volatility, which again, volatility ends up driving a lot of these um, systematic and institutional quantitative funds. Um, and you can see that when real or when dealers are in negative gamma in the red there, we tend to see a higher realized volatility, which kind of leads us into um, the second half of our discussion. So if, if I think about um, how important that negative gamma positioning is, right, does it mean that the market is going to crash? Should we interpret that as volatility is going to hit us immediately? David, how do you think about that? Um, I don't think of it in those terms necessarily. I think it just means that we're going to experience a higher volatility environment. And that can actually work both ways. And we're not profiling in, in this discussion, but this is where our 
probable vol bans come in is that we will see a widening of the general market activity. And yes, the market is more fertile for a precipitous drop in a negative gamma environment, but it's not necessarily uh, it's not necessarily a predictor of a massive drop. It goes both ways.